Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. Today's podcast is sponsored by NutriSense. That was the sound of the NutriSense biosensor. With NutriSense, I've learned some very interesting things about how my food and drink choices affect my body, but also how stress, sleep, and exercise play a big role in my health. Your glucose levels can significantly impact how your body and mind feels and functions throughout the day. NutriSense lets you analyze your glucose levels in real time in response to food, exercise, stress, and sleep. It's been fascinating to see my results and the results of my family members who have also signed up. One of my family members who's pre-diabetic is now clearly able to see when her blood glucose is getting out of control and draw immediate patterns to see how different foods, eating at different times of day, and even sleep quality slash timing and stress directly affect her blood glucose. This has encouraged healthy lifestyle choices that have helped her live well with this condition. NutriSense includes one month of free board-certified nutrition guidance and support where they'll help you interpret the data and promptly answer all your questions, provide suggestions based on your goals, and keep you accountable to a plan. To start decoding your body's messages and pave the way for a healthier life, visit NutriSense.com slash Scott Mize and get $30 off your first month and one month of board-certified nutritionist support. When they ask how you learned about NutriSense, make sure you tell them it was the Scott Mize Show to help support the podcast. That's NutriSense.com slash Scott Mize for $30 off your first month and one month of board-certified nutritionist support. Now on to the show. Suzanne Alexander, MED, is the co-author and editor of the newly released book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution, along with renowned physician, author, nutritional researcher, and speaker, Dr. Chris Noby. Um, MD, who was on the show recently. She is the multi-award winning educator with over 30 years of experience in the classroom and a highly accomplished health and nutrition researcher with over 40 years of research to her credit. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in education from the State University of New York at Portland. Additionally, Suzanne attended the Hart School of Music at the University of Hartford in Connecticut with a major in opera And Suzanne furthered her graduate studies for many years, working towards her PhD in health and nutrition. Welcome to the show, Suzanne. Oh, Scott, thank you for having me. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Of course, my pleasure. Um, So yeah, I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about your background to start. How did you get interested in the field of nutrition and health and uh, what brought you to, you know, writing this book and where you are today? Oh, well, it's a, a very unique story, Scott, <laughs> and thanks for asking me to share this, but um, it goes all the way back to when I was um, a little girl, and I was born into the perfect scenario with the perfect family, the perfect parents, and the perfect grandmother, and I just think it was God's plan to have me on this trajectory to where I am now, and so if we go back to when I was about five, I remember um, well, my father was an animal, a wildlife rehabilitator. And so um, people would bring us wild animals who had been injured, and then it was our job to rehabilitate them and put them back into the wild. But often, often many of them were brand new babies that their moms had been killed on the side of the road. And so before their eyes had even opened, they were brought to us. And if you know anything about nature and in animals, the first parent or the first being that they see when they open their eyes, they believe is their mom. Yeah. And my father always made sure he was the first one because he was their main caretaker. And then the rest of us, there was six in our six children in our family. We're like the Brady Bunch, three boys and three girls. And I was number five out of the six. And um, so we became like their litter, you know, the, the, the pack, their pack. And but they were just my life. I, I marched to a different drummer and um, I, I just the animals were everything to me. I, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to live like them. I wanted to survive like them. And I was born very sick and I had a lot of um, conditions that we didn't know why, but my father was also very sick. And um, I don't, and to this day, I think I was 57 when I was finally diagnosed with um, celiac disease, but you're, so you live for 57 years, not knowing, and you're just 
in chronic pain and not understanding what's going on. And even though I've, I've been a researcher since I was five, <laughs> um, I, I, and I couldn't put my finger on that's what it truly was because there was just so many different different symptoms I had going on. So I have multiple things um, in my genetics that my father also had. But anyway, so but then on top of that, my grandmother, she lived with tribes in Africa for three years. And so wow. she was, she lived right with them. Um, she was in Liberia for two years and Kenya for one year. And whenever she would come home on vacation to, to visit the family, I would just sit at her feet and she would have these slides that she had taken. And it was magnificent. And I would ask her to, to tell what kind of food did they eat? You know, what, what, how did they, were they sick? Were the children sick like me? And she would say, no, they're just so, they're so healthy. And, and she'd huh. talk about their food that was all from the earth. You know, it was the meat that they would that they would hunt and it was the, the, the tubers and the things that they would dig up and they would eat. And she would share the kind of food that they would eat. And, and she just loved it. And she didn't want to leave them. And I couldn't understand, what, what about us? You know, what about your family? But I was just so in awe because my grandma was the same age that I am now. So she was in her 60s. And um, she had was, was a retired teacher and educator like I am. And she just wanted to, to, to do something profound with her life. And she felt living in Africa was, was the ultimate. So anyway, so with that said, um, when I was about 10, and watching the animals in our in our home and watching them thriving. And I was just so sick and my dad was so sick. And I finally looked at my father with my first hypothesis because he would always ask me to bring home books and I'd sit on his lap and we'd, we'd research the different animal species specific diet and what their habitat and their lifestyle would be. And so that was the beginning at five years old of bringing books home and to really become a researcher and to delve into health and nutrition, but for wildlife. But then I coupled that in with my grandmother talking about the native tribes and what they were eating and their health. And finally at 10, I looked at my dad and I said, dad, do you think it's possible that what we're eating, because it's just, it's not the same. Everything we have comes in a box or a can or, or something that's got these, these ingredients that I can't even pronounce. Okay. I said, could this be causing us to be so sick? And maybe if we ate more like our wild animals from the earth and maybe like the tribes in Africa, maybe we wouldn't be sick. And he was, and he was, and he had his doctorate from Columbia University. And he said, I never thought of that. He said, the doctors don't say that because he was on all these medications and things. And, and they wanted to put me on all these medications, but the medications made me sicker. And so, so that was the beginning. And so I started trying to figure it out. And finally, when I went on to college and I had this massive library at 18 years old, I was in oh, heaven. And so I started researching and, and trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Why was I so sick? I had a hiatal hernia that early in my life. My vocal cords as an opera singer were burning up because the acids were literally coming up from, the, you know, through the esophageal area and were burning up my vocal cords. And so I started taking food out and I started with dairy and then I took out meat and I became a full-fledged vegan and it did solve a lot of problems. My migraines weren't as bad. Um, I, my, my hiatal hernia actually healed. It went away, which is a rarity. Wow. Um, but I was still eating grains because it's a plant. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we fast forward and um, I get to around the age 50 and my feet are starting to go numb. I can't feel my feet. And so neuropathy is hitting in. And so I said to my doctor, um, what's this? And she's like, Sue's you're getting older. This is what happens. Wow. And I said, no, God doesn't make mistakes. And I've been telling my doctors all that same, that same thing every time as a little girl, but God doesn't make mistakes. We aren't born to have pain and to be in, in you know, feel so horrible every day. And so I didn't, I just, I, I couldn't, that, that was working. I was beginning to work on my doctorate at that point. So I said, I need you to run a battery of tests on me. And I said, and the most important one, I really need you to look at is copper. And she's like, copper, no one, no one is deficient in copper. I said, I need you to do a copper test. And here I was taking all the supplements. Vegans are good vegans are supposed to take, you know, got to get that B12, got to get all your nutrients in there. And it came back. I was almost at zero. I mean, she was like, oh my gosh. And so all the doctors got together. We don't know what to do. We've never had anyone in deficiency. She needs me in the hospital on an IV. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to take care of this. So I started questioning, is veganism correct? Mm. Am I doing more damage than, than good to my body? So I had my first colonoscopy at 50, which you're supposed to do. A good person does that, thinking it's going to be pristine. I'm eating the perfect diet. My gastroenterologist comes out and he says, I said, how was it? And he said, I can't tell you. I can't see anything. I said, you, so it's clean. He goes, no, your entire colon is embedded with nuts and seeds. 
Mm. Wow. And I'm like, wait, they're power foods. Everyone knows that. He said, whoever told you that humans could eat and digest seeds? Get wow. them out of your so I'm thinking, this is a gastroenterologist. He must see this all the time, you know? So then I'm really questioning, what am I doing? But anyway, I, I, I keep thinking, no, no, I'm, I'm studying and everything is saying plant-based, plant-based, plant-based. So I get to 57 years old. And at this point, I'm now raw. I was vegan, but now I'm a raw vegan. Everything is just eating everything. Nothing's being cooked. Wow. And my doctor calls me after some lab work I had done. And she said, Suze, you're dying. And I said, excuse me. And she says, you literally have hardly no white blood cells, your blood cell, your red blood cells, your platelets. You are plummeting out. We think you have a rare cancer. You have to go see a hematologist, ontolo- oncologist. So I'm, I go to see that, that group. And after multiple, multiple visits, she says, we don't know. We think you have a rare bone marrow cancer. Or and at that point, I had, put, when I was 50, 40, 48, I had put, I was, I had allowed my former husband um, mental, uh, emotional tor- torture about how I looked, oh. really get in touch to b- involve how I felt about myself and being ugly because I had nursed my children for six years, three years each. And he said I was hor- horrendous looking. And so I put implants in. So they said, or instead of the bone marrow cancer, you might have a rare breast implant cancer that's caused by that. I'm like, what? are you kidding me? And so I had to research all of this. And, and I went back to see her again. And she said, if you do the bone marrow testing, it's extremely painful. And she says, but I know you. And she said, I need to ask you this question. If we do the testing, she said, will you get treated? I said, no, mm. I said, I'll, I'll treat myself naturally and I will heal. And she said, so then why put you through that testing? And she said, but we really believe that's what you have because nothing else makes sense. Why you have your blood cells, everything stopped product producing. And I said, well, how long would I have to live? And she said, without treatment, 15 years. And I said, well, I said, then you'll, you can agree to go with that. And I'll just agree to say, I don't have cancer and I'll go be on my way. <laughs> and so that's what I did. So then I went and had my breast implants removed. And that was huge because when they got in there, uh, my body had had a, a severe allergic reaction. I had saline implants, but the outside was silicone. And I'm extremely, like everything else in my life, I'm extremely allergic to silicone. So when she opened up my chest, there would had my body had literally, because um, the longer you have implants in, and they were in for 10 years, they start, the, um, the silicone starts flaking off into your body from the heat temperature of your body. And then your body, if you're allergic to it, starts trying to fight it off. And it oh. caught an entire web of, almost like a cancerous web that had grown all underneath my armpits, through my chest, everywhere. It was, and so she had to go in and scrape it all out and get everything out of there because I couldn't breathe. And as an opera singer, you have to have breath support. And I kept wondering, why can't I breathe anymore? And she said, that's why everything was just closing in. So anyway, I almost died after that surgery because as she was scraping everything and because I was so highly anemic and had no blood, hardly anything to to, to save myself, I had lost about 60% of my blood. And was literally dying on the table. So they had to go back in, cauterize everything. They wanted to do a, a transfusion, a blood transfusion. And I said, no, God will heal me. I want everything done naturally. I don't want any heroics. If I'm meant to live and God's got a plan for me, I'll continue. Well, I survived that, of course. <laughs> and um, so then I met, I did more research. I realized, and, and my doctor, she was a, uh, she called herself a quasi um, vegan. And she said, um, she said, um, Suze, you cannot be a vegan. She says, I think you have celiac disease. Wow. And she says, everything that I see on your, your charts are telling you you have celiac disease. And she said, on top of that, you cannot be a vegan or you will die. And I said, but you're a vegan. She says, no, I eat one piece of piece of fish every week. And she says, no one can be vegan. And she was a brilliant, brilliant surgeon. Uh-huh. And so at that point I went home and I said to my family, I have to start eating meat. And so one of my friends is a hunter and he brought home, he brought me some fresh venison, a deer. And I had my first meat in like 25, 30 years. And it was profound. Oh, Scott, it was just like every cell. It's just like, oh my golly, it just comes to life. And it was just so overwhelming. And I realized I had made a huge mistake by removing meat from my diet. So then I met Sally um, Norton and um, 
she took me under her wing and held my hand for a very long, long, long time so that we could get all of the oxalates and toxins from the plants out of my body because it had been decades and decades. And our philosophy was, is it possible that the oxalates had, had begun to replace the bone marrow in my bones, which some studies indicate that's possibly happening to many of us who are eating so many plants that it's, it's just not natural to eat that many plants. And so um, slowly we, we took eight months to get plants completely out of my body. And as we went through it, we, we didn't have oxalate dumping, but I was getting styes coming out of my eyes. The, the, the oxalates were pouring out of my eyes. I was getting bone spurs growing out of my body. It was horrendous, but she held my hand and she was just brilliant. And she hung in there because I'd have days, I just can't give up plants. I can't, you got to do it. You're going to die. We've got to get, so we finally got, and then at the end, and then I partnered also then with Paul Saladino mm -hmm. and he took me to become full carnivore. And um, that was profound. I mean, because we could see that my white blood cells, and my red blood cells, my platelets were starting to come back to life. The more meat I ate. And of course, the more plants I had, I was no longer eating plants. So then my body could get release all the, the oxalates and other toxins there. And so then after about three months on carnivore, my feet and my leg cramps were just out of control. And even though I was doing all the electrolytes, everyone says it was just not, it wasn't working for me. And I said to Paul, I said, I don't know. I said, the more I research this and the more I, I know I've researched tribes my entire life. I said, there, there really isn't anyone who really is a true carnivore, even the Maasai who I will be living with in about two weeks, by the way, <laughs> um, they do have plants at times, even when the Maasai warriors are out in the, in marching and they're, and they're out into the woods, there are times where they ha don't have food and they will eat bark. They mm. will have plants. They will have certain things that they have to rely on the medicinal purposes. They have plants, the, the Eskimos who I will be living with soon <laughs> also eat plants at times. And we've been kind of led to believe all these things which my mission is to show that we do need a little bit of everything. Just not, we don't, we need to have balance. There needs to be balance. Um, but I'll be able to report all of this. And um, I'm hoping today when we could talk about um, now that we're to current day, me at 62 and I'm thriving, I'm just thriving. I've never felt so healthy in my life. I'm not full carnivore and I'm not full vegan. I'm, I'm in, the, I'm mostly animal based. I will say most of my, my foods I eat are animal and I love that, but I do have a few bit of bits of fruit that I do add for my electrolytes, my minerals that I truly believe that I need. I can't get through, through animals. And with that said, now we just came back from the, the Pacific islands and we were, at, we were, we were with about six to seven islands and we were di different cultures, different tribes, and we were able to see what they are eating there. And we wrote about this in our book uh, about the Papua New Guineans and, and the Tukasintas and things. And, um, so we can talk about that, but I'll, I'll stop rambling. I know, Scott, you're probably like, okay, I got to get a word in my edge. Oh, that's amazing. No, you're excellent. I, I didn't want to interrupt because <laughs> such an interesting story and amazing the resilience and fortitude you had through all of it um, and the willingness to um, hold strong to, to what you believed and what you had learned, but also come to new realizations and change your mind, which I think is the hallmark of a true scientist. Thank you. And it's so, so true. And I say this to Chris all the time, Dr. Kenobi, I always say to him um, that if we get dogmatic and we have blinders on and we are so rigid in our thinking or we're making money off of what we believe and we don't want to change our opinion, that's, that's not science. And that's not, that's not being honest and truth. And we, we need to be, um, we have to have the flexibility to understand that no one knows, only God knows the truth. Mm -hmm. And but we're, we're seekers of the truth and we should always be on that mission and to be transparent at all times. And I've always told my followers when I was vegan, um, I had a lot of people that were following me all over the world at that time. But I kept saying, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm my own guinea pig. I'm just going to share with you. I will always be honest with you. If something isn't working, if my health is failing, I will always tell you exactly what I'm feeling when I'm, when I'm trying new things. And, um, and I really feel that, I mean, right now I, I totally believe that seed oils are so toxic. And mm -hmm. when we've studied so many cultures and, and tribes and, and, and populations all over the world, it's the one thing that none of them, that those who really are thriving without disease, 
It's the one thing that they don't have in their diet is seed oils yeah. and processed food. And, um, and I think that that's the key. And we, it really came to fruition when we were in the Pacific Islands seeing those people who don't have seed oils and then the, those who used to live ancestrally. And then they've now got maybe 10 to 20, 20, 25% of processed food now in their diet along with their um, ancestral diet. They're crumbling. Just a little bit of our processed food is is just wreaking havoc on their health, and so, that was huge. That was huge to see, Scott. That was that was immense. Um, yeah. So, what is inspired? Talk um, about these expeditions you've been on, and what has inspired them? What has um, caused you to finally do them after being, I imagine, inspired by your mother all those years ago? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's true. And I I remember saying to my grandma, I'd said, um, one day I want to follow in your footsteps. It was, it's just so, she was like Wonder Woman to me, you know, <laughs> she was uh, traveling by herself and, you know, my age and, and just, she just said, I, I just want to be able to do something profound with my life, you know? And, and she said, and, and these people are so beautiful and they're so real. They haven't been touched by our toxic world. And, you know, this is back, you know, in the sixties and seventies, you know, before we were even as, and now we're really becoming what a world we have now. And so it was still quite an innocent world at that time. But um, so now I, I just I've always thought I'm going to, to do the same thing my grandmother did, but I, I want to take it to the next step, you know, because I, I know what being sick is like. It's been my whole life. And but to have my health and to be stronger. And um, I mean, I can do splits now. I, when I was taking ballet and as a young girl, um, they always said I couldn't because my hips would always pop out of joint. And now I can do splits at 62, you know? So where anything's possible, you know? And I climb trees. My, my raccoons taught me how to climb trees and I, and I still love to climb trees, you know? Um, so it's just a beautiful thing, Scott. And I think that all of that, and then, and then I met, and then I met Chris and he's, um, he, he, he had to find also through his health conditions to find, I had to find the truth, you know, and in his medical practice and, and, and you know, he, he, he works with people with, you know, surgery, he's an eye surgeon and my mother is blind from macular degeneration, AMD. And that, that's, that didn't have to happen. And I used to always tell her, you know, tell my, my dad, he, he shouldn't be dead. He died of prostate cancer and that shouldn't have happened. You know, had they had they not been eating all these processed foods, they'd still be alive, and my mom would still be able to see. And um, and it's the same thing. And Chris is healing his arthritis. Um, you know, I, I I my celiac disease. You know, I don't have a lot of the issues I had with because I don't eat grains anymore. Um, and so we can heal so many things with it's. It, you know, it's like Hippocrates Hi said, "Let food be thy medicine, and medicine is thy food." You know, and I just think um, what we're doing now. We've always, Chris and I, when we first met and, and we kind of joined together as a team because we had the same philosophies and the same vision and mission um, to go to live with these tribes that we, we read about. And of course, I've always said that, you know, I always the first thing I do when I'm doing research is to look at who uh, who is the person that's backing the research. And um, if I see a pharmaceutical company or big food or something that has their own agenda, that makes me question the authenticity of and the accuracy of, of a, a study that's being done. And so I, Chris and I both feel the same way. And so we thought the best way to do it is to go and see it with our own eyes and everything. And, and of course I, I planned, I planned and organized our whole Pacific islands re, um, research expedition. And before going, I was just so delving into all the places we were going to go to and really getting to know the people and, and the areas and I could tell by what I was seeing, it wasn't going to be good when we got there. And it's the same thing on my Africa trip that's coming up. I'm already seeing things that aren't going to, aren't really going to look very good in terms of our processed food are infiltrating these uh, remote tribes. And um, so we can talk more about that and, um, as we go along, Scott. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know you have a presentation, um, so I'd love, love for you to share that up. Um, okay. and you can talk through some of that. And for folks listening to the audio, um, if you get a chance, check out on YouTube the video version um, because uh, Suzanne has some awesome slides she's going to share with us. Hey, Scott, can you see that? Yep. Okay. All right. So this is where we, we, we started. Okay. And so we had these islands over here. Where the, the, the islands that are numbered. So you can see Jaipura is the first island we stopped to. Now, the other ones, are these are all of our ports we had to keep flying to because in order to get to all of these remote islands, it takes forever. 
to get yeah. there and just finding the, pl- the flights to get there was a huge thing. So, um, so what we did is we first went to Jayapur and this, this is in Papua New Guinea or, or we were in West Papua and it's in Indonesia. And so we first flew to Jayapura and um, this is, uh, it's it's remote, but it's, they consider it kind of like the city area. And even though it doesn't, it doesn't have the high rises, like when you think of New York city, <laughs> but um, it's, it was more populated. And so we went there and you'll see, um, I'll show you some of the different stores and things that we went in. And then we went to Wamina. Now Wamina is where the, one of my favorite tribes and it's called the Dani tribe, D-A-N-I. And they're a remote tribe that live way up in the highland region and mm-hmm. very similar to what we, we studied when we were doing the Tukasinta in, in, in Papua New Guinea. And so they mostly live on sweet potatoes. And that was amazing to actually see, do they really live on sweet potatoes? But they yeah. all they also, every once in a while, maybe once or twice a month, they might have a bit of pork. And we'll talk mm-hmm. more about that as we get we go through the slides. Um, and then from w- Wamina, we flew to Honiera, which is the Solomon Islands. And, and so we, we spent time there looking at, um, you know, the stores and meeting people who are eating ancestrally, mostly. I can only say mostly there because they were being infiltrated. And then from Honiera, we flew over to Samoa. And in Samoa, uh, we were shocked at what we saw there. And we'll talk about that as we get to do the slides. And then from Samoa, we flew to Vanuatu which was magnificent. This would, this would, I would consider for us to be the healthy island of the Pacific Islands. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that when we, when we see what they're consuming there and what we found in their stores and so forth. Then we were supposed to fly to one of my favorite spots, which would have been Tana. And that's right here, number six, but our flight was canceled and we couldn't wow. get there. And it was, it was canceled for the entire week. And so we were so, I was trying to figure out a way to go <laughs> to get there somehow because they have a, a very remote tribe there that we were going to spend time with. So I, I wasn't, but one day I will go back there. And then from Vanuatu, then we ended up going to Fiji and everyone thinks, well, that's just a touristy era. Well, there's actually a, a small um, settlement that we'll talk about when we get there that's was one of the first settlements and you'll see what's happened there tragically as well. So let's continue on as we go through the slide. Um, Are you so get in touch with all of these people um, <laughs> for your visits? Like, oh, that's, you know, what took, oh, that's part of what took me so long is I had to really make connections. Um, yeah. I really had to study. Um, it was, it was, you know, 24 seven for a few months um, of going. It's the same thing I'm doing now for the Africa trip. Um, it, it, the research you have to do beforehand because you don't want any surprises when you get there. Um, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And, uh, but it was worth it because then when you get there, you don't have the surprises. It's like, oh, it's exactly what I thought. And yeah. of course our guides and our translators were remarkable and you'll meet some of them in the slideshow as well. And it's, it was just really, um, profound. It was just profound. Great question, Scott. Thank you. All right. So here we are. Um, so our first, again, you can see up here, um, I, I, I came from Syracuse. That, that's the airport that's closest to where I live. And so I flew from Syracuse, then to Atlanta, and then to LAX. Chris was already down in Melbourne. He was at the Low Carb Down Under conference there. Mm. And so we thought that would help to save some money because he was already there to do it at that time because the cost of flying is just so, so huge. So then from LAX, I flew down to Melbourne. I met him there. Then we flew to, in order to get to Jayapura, number one, we flew from Melbourne to Bali. And then from Bali to Makassar, and then from Makassar to Jayapura. Wow. Okay. And it was exhausting, just the flying and waiting and sitting around, but it was so, again, so worth it. So in Jayapura, here's our first stop, Jayapura. Here we go. So here we are landing and look at the, the landscape. It's just so lush and green. It's just so beautiful. And so this is what their mall looks like. So this is kind of like a city. Okay. This is like probably the biggest building in their, in their, in their village city area. They, most people get around on motorcycles. Motorcycles were everywhere, just zooming past us. It was just kind of scary because they did, they just are everywhere. You have to watch out for them. They won't watch out for you. So we went into this mall and in there they have a hypermart. So it's kind of like what we would have maybe like a Walmart or just a, a, it's a, it's got a little bit of everything in the groceries as well. So we went into there and lo and behold, we find our first wall of oils, our seed oils. Wow. And I was like, oh, golly. 
And so I, I put out there, I put a video of Chris. Um, uh, so if you people, if you want to go on to um, Ancestral um, Health Foundation, either on Facebook or, or um, on Instagram or Twitter, we I have these videos all posted. You can go and watch them. And Chris will be telling about what we're finding in these. And this is um, part of what we saw. And amazingly enough, the most popular bestseller in Papua is palm oil. Now, mm. palm oil of all the oils, I mean, it, it's not a bad oil. It's about a 10, about 10 linoleic acid, a percent linoleic acid compared to others that, you know, sunflower, safflower, they're like in the 70s. Okay. Um, uh, soybean is like 55 uh, uh, linoleic acid content, huge. This isn't bad. However, however, it's still, if it's in everything, and, and, and of course, the size of the packages that we're seeing people are buying, I, I, I couldn't believe. I mean, these, these, and, and the people are buying them like crazy. And that adds up. It really adds up. And remember, it doesn't have the vital fat soluble vitamins of A, D, and K2. And mm -hmm. as Weston Price found in his research, we need those. And that's why the healthy cultures who live so, so long and so thriving without disease, because they have those. And we only get those from animal, animal fats. And so this, you know, everyone's saying when they see this, well, then we can have that. This is good. No, it's still, it's still quite high. I mean, 10, 10% linoleic acid is high compared to animal fats being at 2%. Mm. You know, coconut oil is 2%. Yeah. And coconut oil can be great. However, you're going to see as we go on in, in this, it's not what we thought. Um, <laughs> we, we had a surprise, it, which it's, I, I still found that in my, um, my research, it was going to happen and it did occur. But with that said, um, but, but coconut oil doesn't have the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K2. And so it has some other great things in it, but we need those. And that's what we need to always focus on, that we're missing those in our diet if we're only using these oils as our fats. So it's right. really important, really important. Next, we also found that they had things like we have. Okay. And if you notice the ingredients, corn chips, they have, and of course, palm oil. But interestingly enough, in Jayapura, a lot of their processed food had palm oil rather than when you look at chips in our area, the, the same thing, they won't have palm oil. They'll have oil. We'll have canola oil. We will, we'll have the higher linoleic acid in America compared to what they were having, what we found in Jayapura. So we thought that was that something. It was better. At least their processed food in Jayapura wasn't as toxic as ours. It's toxic, but not as toxic. Yeah. Then we found the Pringles can. And of course, again, their Pringles can, they've got the oil that they use in Pringles is palm oil. Mm. So what we have in America, ours, our vegetable oil is, if you look here carefully, it's got, it's got corn oil, it's got uh, soybean oil, look at the sunflower oil, look at the different oils we have in our Pringles compared to what's sold in Jayapura. Yeah. Quite interesting, quite interesting. So we thought, hmm, if only we could at least, at least get ours down to palm oil and get rid of all these other high linoleic acid uh, omega-6 oils. <clears throat> so what we found the most prevalent seed oil in Jayapur was palm oil and which, which wasn't bad. We, we were pleasantly surprised that at least that's the most prevalent oil. They didn't have a lot of soybean. They didn't have a lot of canola. They didn't have rapeseed, all these really high, high level linoleic acid, uh, toxic oils. Now we go to Wamina and this is where the Dani tribe lives and they're way up high. So we had to travel way, way, way up high into the mountains uh, of West Papua, Indonesia, to stay with the in this tribe. And here we are getting off the plane. It was a small plane that got us up there. And then we go, our, our guide, Rami, he took us to our first market that we could see. And, and most of these people who are selling are from the Denny tribe. They uh, The younger people now, they don't dress as ancestrally, which you'll see soon coming up. They don't dress as ancestrally as their, their, their cohorts that are really living ancestrally, but they're bringing all of their, their, their goods, their crops, their produce. And so we got to see what their what kind of food that they're selling. This was, uh, this is Rami, our guide, and he was our translator as well. And he's eating be beetle nuts. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but um, it's, you'll notice a lot of them is their teeth are red. 
and they chew on this and they believe that it's actually helping their teeth. Um, mm. But it's more of, I think they get this high out of it. It's a very, um, they get a real mellow feeling from eating it as well. Mm. But they believe it's helping their teeth, but you'll notice that many of them are losing their teeth. Um, so I'm not sure if it's not really helping them. It may be hurting them. In my research, there is some research showing that it really is quite damaging to the teeth. Um, but also if they're eating so many um, sweet potatoes and not getting a lot of animal plant, animal fats, I think they're so low in the, those vital um, fats, all the vitamins. I think that that's causing a, such a havoc on their teeth. Otherwise they look fairly healthy. <laughs> Here we are entering our, our village, the first um, Dani tribe village. And of course, this right here is Rami. And this is our driver. And over here, this is our porter. And so they always traveled everywhere with us to make sure that we were safe and we had everything that we needed. So here we are with the tribe. And yes, I'm, I'm trying to be appropriate by covering them. They don't wear, they're scantily clad, as we would say. <laughs> and um, it was wonderful. They were very welcoming, a little shy at times. Um, but willing to, you know, through translation, answer our questions. Um, you can see that they live in these little huts. Um, this is right here where I'm circling right here with my cursor. That's the men's hut. The men only live together. And then the women's have, they have a couple more because there's more women than men. And they, the men, it's, um, they don't, they, they can have as many wives as they want. But again, like you'll see in many of the cultures, they buy their, their wives according to how many pigs they have. Mm. And so that's kind of their currency. And now Wamina, the word Wam in, in Dani is pig. And they revere the pig. The pig is just so important to them. And so they won't eat their own pigs because they're like almost like family. But mm. another tribe, they may eat something from another tribe or a wild boar or a pig if they can find that. But they won't eat their own because they're like family. So Wam, Wamina is named after pig. And that's the name of the village in the region that they're in. Um, so again, this is the tribe. We did notice that a lot of the children were uh, malnourished looking because they had that distended, the, the belly is very distended, which means low protein. And mm. so, um, again, if you're just living mostly on plants and, and mostly sweet potatoes, they're in need of more meat. Yeah. Over here, you'll notice right here, this is a, um, a mummy of a 350 year old chief. That was that was there a long time ago, and the chief that we met at the time is is his relative. They all they're all the the, the Maple uh, family, and that's that that was the chief at the time. So that was amazing to see that mummy as well. Oh. Okay, you here's the looking down. It's like looking down the street of the, <laughs> the village. Here we are, and again over here, these are the uh, huts where the women would live, and again this over here is where the uh, men would live, and this is the chief sitting right there. So it's really remarkable. And it's just, they have a, a whole built, a whole hut that's called their kitchen. And in that they've got a couple fires. And so, uh, and of course I've got videos I posted on, on, on social media that you can actually go and look and, and I'm creating a YouTube channel that will have all of our um, destinations and all of our research and, and videos on that as well on YouTube under Ancestral um, Foundation, Ancestral Health Foundation. Here we are. And this is the chief right here, Chief Marple. And you can see he's dressed in normal clothing. Many of them are now dressing normally. Although over here, you can see that, you know, the children are wearing shorts, but they're still without shirts. Here's a woman here, but he was wonderful. So he was, um, he could not speak our language, but Rami, our interpreter would, would answer questions when we would speak with him. And he was very kind. And he even, it's usually forbidden that a woman will go into the men's hut, but he allowed me to go in and to sit. And um, it was pretty swell. It was pretty neat. And here's Chris with a pig. Here's their pigs. <laughs> and you can see them all basking over here. And uh, there's Dr. Kenobi with one of the pigs. But they, again, they won't eat these because they're, they're very prized to them. They're very special to them. Here we are taking our, our hi, I, I requested because I've always wondered as a little girl, how do different tribes get their salt? They don't, if they don't have stores where they get mm -hmm. their salt from. And so I specifically asked Rami, our guide, could he request that, that the Dani show us what they do. And so eloquently, um, one of the women and one of the men said that they would take all of us up. We had to climb a very, very steep mountain. And Chris got his knee. He's always had arthritis and problems with his knee. And um, this was not a good decision to do for him. So he's going to have surgery at the end of this month to oh. heal a torn meniscus. So um, 
but we, we, he got through it. He was a trooper, but here we, so here we are going up this mountain and uh, you can see the beautiful water features and we're taking a break up here. These are our, our guides. And this over here, you can see this woman here. She's going to be showing us how to, how they collect salt. And it was really amazing. I could, and here I studied this. I've never heard of this technique of collecting salt this way. So here we are. Look at the view over here. It is spectacular. But here she is. So the whole way up, she's carried um, this banana stalk. So it's not a banana, it's banana stalk. For those of you who are just listening, it's this long stick that's cut from the banana tree. And so she's taking a stick and she's scraping the outside of it. And she's taking all of the fibrous outers outside off of it, which think about this, the genius that they had to figure this out ancestrally to know that when you remove the fiber, it's going to allow it to become more porous. Mm. Okay, able to absorb something better than you left it on. So she's going to peel each of these layers off and keep scraping and scraping until she's got all these layers taken apart. And now they're more receptive to, to collect and, and absorb the water. So here she is over here and she's got the, the pieces, the layers that she stripped apart. And now she's squishing and squeezing and turning and twisting. And I thought, I got to get in there. I've got to join her. <laughs> this looks amazing. So I'm in the in the salt spring with her and we're twisting and turning and just, and we do for about 30 minutes, you have to do this to really make sure. And it's like you're pickling. It's almost like you're pickling these, these skins of the banana stalk. Yeah, cool. And then you, bought it, you ring, ring them all out. And of course, you wanted me to taste it to see that the water was indeed salty. And then I tasted a piece of the... Um, of, of the, the skin and it was salty, but not extremely salty. Like what, what people think of, you know, they're yeah. doused anything. Let's get the Redmonds or whatever we're using. the yeah. calcium. And it's not, it's very, very mild. It's a very mild yeah. flavor of salt. So they wad it all up into a ball and then they take it back. You can see that on the, on her head, it hangs off of her head. And then this bag that they make out themselves, they crochet themselves with their fingers. Um, they put all their goods in there. So whether it's sweet potatoes or whatever they're collecting, bananas or or the salt, the, the wad of salt, she's going to put that, and that's how she carries everything on her over her head and her back. Even sometimes her children do on this. So then they take it back to the, um, the the village and they dry it. And whenever they feel they need salt, they either break it off and they eat a piece, or they can add it to their meals. And mm. that's how they, that's where their salt comes from. It was in, it was just ingenious, ingenious. Yeah. I thought, how, how swell. And and then now this was interesting. Notice what these are. These are the containers of seed oils, palm oil containers. Huh. And we were when we were go going up to, to the spring, these were some of the young, the young Danny who have now kind of are transitioning between trying to decide do they want to stay as a Danny or do they want to kind of be a little in between, um, you know, of the, the cultures. We want to start bringing oils in. And this is what they're going up instead of doing the traditional way. Now they're taking these empty seed oil containers and they're bringing the salt water back with those. So I said to Chris, I said, does this mean that they're using these seed oils? If they're using these containers, or it could be that they're just getting them from other people that don't want them and they're rinsing them all. So I don't know. It's speculation, speculation. Yeah. So that was kind of sad. I was like, oh, fiddlesticks that they're using. I see the seed oil containers. Yeah. So now here we are. Um, so at this point, um, Chris, was so injured he he's he was going to stay back in, in his hotel room and I was going to take the next day and this was the next day to spend with another Danny tribe and this was the day that I had planned so specially for Chris because he in all his presentations he talks about the sweet potatoes and how you know they are so revered in in the Pacific Islands and this is the day they were going to show me how they prepare and what they do with, with sweet potatoes so this is our sweet potato day so we're entering the village and they usually have some beautiful way of look at the entrances. They'll have something you have to climb over or whatever, but it's just beautiful. Wait, hold on here. Um, so then we go into the village and you can see this is a small village compared to the one we were just previously in the day before. Very, very small. And um, so we're entering and you'll see that they're extremely, they don't, they do not wear hardly any clothes. The men wear a, a, a little uh, gourd called a kotika. And that's all they wear. It's just a gourd with a, a two strings that hold this up um, or their genitalia. And that's what they wear. Now, the man that we're looking at today, um, he he also has mud that he's placed on his lower extremities along with his kotika because they felt it's um, it's like a celebration having me there. And they wanted to like celebrate with me. And so I oh. thought it was an honor of me. I thought it was quite quite beautiful. So here we are, and you can see here that she's digging up. She uses a stick to dig up in their gardens. They've got all gardens all around them. 
of their, with their sweet potatoes. And it's all different varieties, all different kinds of varieties. It's not just one kind. And so she's digging them up here. And then they go down near their area and they start to wash the sweet potatoes. And it looks like a mud puddle, but it's like a spring, another spring that they're using to wash their, their, um, with the potatoes and, um, and anything else that we were going to be consuming that day. And here we are now we bring, so we bring all the potatoes back. And then we go down, way down into the valley. Look at that, isn't that view? It was just breathtaking. There's no no one, no people, no civilization as far as the eye can see. We are so remote. And then they go down and what they're doing for, for a long, long time. And, and of course, I don't know what, what's going on. This is all new to me. They're picking and all of these, either green vegetation or old weeds and sticks and twigs. And they're, they're picking and picking and picking and bringing them all back, which you'll see. And they're, they're carrying, I mean, look at what the women are carrying on their heads. Wow. Isn't, so these are the things that they're going to use to make the fire and the earthen pit, which is, this is how they cook. And this is what they have to do, the, the, the lengths they have to go through to cook their food. Yeah. And so we wonder why why they, there's no obesity and, and that they're very healthy. They have to move all the time. Yeah. And it's, it's just beautiful. A woman in the middle has like a full bonfire on her head. Yes. I mean, isn't it remarkable? Look at that. Look at that. That's, so these are the, the twigs and all the things that they're going to be using for the for this cooking of just the potatoes, the sweet potatoes. So over here, you can see that they've cut down some banana trees and things, and they're, they're building the fire pit that they're going to put the stones in. You can see over here, they're putting all of these stones, so many stones into this blazing fire that they're going to get going. And that's going to heat them up. Like, so it's basically cooking the stones and become extremely hot. Mm. Then while, that, while the stones are cooking, <laughs> we went out and they wanted to pick this fruit. It's called a red fruit. And um, it's, it's, I've never had it before. Um, you can notice over here, I went to, to, move that out of the way. And I didn't realize there was, it's almost like razor sharp, like a saw. And I almost cut through my hand. But I was like, Oh, golly, look at this. And so he wanted to have this special um, fruit for me. And so they, they brought it back. And uh, of course this is called, they call, they call this fruit called, it's called the pandan fruit. Many of you may have heard of it, but it's, it's the, they call it Bua Mera there in West Papua. And of course, Bua means fruit and Mera means red, which is red fruit. Mm. Here we are. I thought this was a beautiful picture. Here's one of the women. She's slowly, she's blowing to get the spark they, that they ignited the fire to get going here. And you can see the twigs that she had carried on her head are all being used. So they get the fire going and now they're adding more of the, of the, the different dried uh, vegetation, the grasses and things to, to get that fire and keep it going. Um, and then over here, I'm over here helping them. There's another pit. And in this pit, this is going to be, they call it the earthen oven. And this is where they're going to be preparing all the green foliage, all the green leaves are going to be helped to steam. When they put the rocks in there, the rocks will help along with the, with the, which you'll see with the potatoes. And it literally doesn't really cook, but they're steaming because of all this water that's in the vegetation. It's, it's genius, absolute genius. Over here, you can see that um, in Ananias, that was his name. He's cutting out all the insides. I thought we'd be eating the inside of the red fruit, but it's not. We don't eat inside. It's the outside. And it's not even, you'll see, it's, it's quite interesting. The whole the whole thing. Here you can see where she's carrying. Look at how they're using the tool, the tong. They take the sticks and split the stick down. So they, they made themselves like a little grabber tool. And this is how they're carrying over the extremely scorching hot rocks. And they're yeah. lining the bottom of the earthen pit where the green foliage is. And then on top of that, over here, look at all the potatoes that they've, wow. all, and look at the different colors. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. That's a beautiful, no pesticides, no fertilizer, nothing toxic It's raised totally as they were intended. God intended. Then on top of that, they're going to now put a layer of stones on top of the potatoes. Okay. Then over here, they put another layer over here on the left. They put a layer of, of banana leaves on top of the stones. They're on top of the potatoes. And now they put the red fruit or the pandan fruit on top of that, because that's going to get steamed as well. They sprinkle a little bit of water on top of that just to help with the steam. And then they bring up all the grass and they fold it all up. You can see all the layers over here. Wait, oh, all the layers, pardon me. All these layers over here, Scott, can you see these all over here? Yep. Okay. They fold all that on top to make a dome over the top. So it just closes it all in. It's like the perfect convection, almost a convection oven. And yeah. then that they put more stones just to hold it all down. And then 
And Ananias went out and he he found uh, this like vine, which is going to be used like a rope. Again, everything from nature. And they wrap it around. And you can see over here how they wrapped it around to tie it and bundle it up nicely like a package. Yeah. And now all that food in there is now cooking nicely, steaming nicely. Yeah. And so again, they say, well, let's go into the hut. Let's go into the kitchen. So we go into the kitchen and over here is the kitchen. And you can see it's just grass on the on the ground. And they've, they've got their fire pit going. And right here, can you see this right here? They've actually yeah. put more sweet potatoes, but they're just putting it right into the fire. Ah. Okay. And because the, they're going to have a snack while we're waiting for the sweet potatoes to cook. <laughs> and so, but they also are heavy smokers. Both of the tribes we were, we were with, um, they smoke constantly. And yeah. I, I said to Rami, our guide, I said, you know, Rami, um, does are they smoking their own? Are they rolling their own tobacco or what? And he says, no, most of them are buying it from a, a shop, which he was, I'll show you later. Um, mm. I called it the shack where they can go and get like our, our toxic cigarettes. But he did show me that they do have plants. They do grow their own tobacco and the older, the older generation rolls their own. But so mm. they were smoking constantly. So it's sitting in here. Not only do we have the fire going, but they're all smoking and I'm coughing away, coughing away. And I never heard them once cough, never heard them once wheeze when we were walking them out and they were all smoking while they're walking and they're not coughing at all. And so this has always baffled me in the research that there's, oh. there's no lung cancer. There's, there's no emphysema. How can this be? That they aren't experiencing what we do with cigarette smoking. It just doesn't. And, and, and plus the, the, the smoke from the ongoing fire. I mean, that's, it's going all the time to keep yeah. them warm. up in the mountains. You think it in Pacific islands, Oh, it must be warm, but at nighttime it gets very, very, very cold, very mm. cold. And so those fires are going all the time, but over here, now you can see in this middle picture, you can see where they're removing, they're taking the stones off. And now you can see the cooked on this third picture. You can see the cooked sweet potatoes. Wow. And here they are taking out the pandan fruit, the red fruit. And instead, what she does, and you can see they, they have this the handmade carved tray. She scrapes all of the, the, the seeds off of the outside. Mm. And she squeezes it and squeezes it and squeezes it because they, they're all cooked now. And look at the juice that comes out of it. Yeah. And wow. then, of course, their, their dish is just a banana leaf. That's what their dish is. Yeah. Uh, they make use of everything. And so here, um, my, my, uh, my my porter, he's handing me my first sweet potato uh, off of the the off of this earthen pit. It was it was remarkable. I mean, I haven't had I don't haven't had sweet potatoes in a while because I try to stay away from the high oxalate plants, and this is one of them um, for me. It was it was amazing, and they don't use spices. I mean, really, it's, spices throughout all the islands. I hardly saw anyone using spices, which mm. I thought was quite remarkable. Very very low in spice use. Um, then he handed me some of the skin of the pandan fruit and um, I watched what everyone else was doing with it because I wasn't sure. And they just kind of chew on it and they, they, because it's very, very fibrous, they mm. chew on it and get the juice out of it and then they spit it out. Mm. So I was following through and then you're getting ready to eat my, um, my sweet potato. And then um, the children were coming into the village and you can see that they're wearing um, regular clothes. And, um, but they were joining in on the feast and they've got their dogs, dogs are everywhere. They all have a lot of dogs. And then this is my porter and he's showing how he's, um, trying the, uh, the, um, the pandan fruit juice. It was quite bitter. I thought it'd be very bitter, but I was dipping it using it as a dipping sauce to put um, my sweet potato in. And that made it quite lovely. And nice. you can, just, you can just pick bananas. It's got fruit everywhere. I mean, yeah. you, you really can't go hungry because it's just fruit is growing everywhere. It yeah. just Free for the picking. It's amazing. Coconuts, bananas, papaya, you, you name it. It's everywhere. Hmm. This is the shack I was telling you about. This is where, and they've hmm. got them every couple of miles. The Danny don't have cars. They walk everywhere and they are usually barefoot. And um, they just walk everywhere. And these little shacks, I call, that are popping up all over the place. And in these shacks, they've got their cigarettes. They've got their candy. They've got their oils. Hmm. But they also have other important things. Like, you know, a lot of the women, um, when they when they start menstruation and so forth, they do have their feminine products there, which is good because they said that really has helped them to not have to go to a specific building and just stay there for their whole week while they're going through their period. So this is that's that's helpful. There are some helpful things, but they're also selling hurtful things as well. So we, in, in, so again, in Wamina, before heading home to the highlands, we did find that palm oil was also 
a very prevalent oil used in their stores. As you can see, when we went up the mountain, that the, the young the young Dani people were carrying things in the the, the palm oil uh, containers as well. So, um, but again, we know it again, cigarettes, candy, processed food are brought into the village by tourists as well. And it's just heart, heart aching to see, just heart wrenching. I thought this was kind of funny at the, uh, when we were flying out, it says, do not spit a, a beetle or betel on the floor. That's the red uh-huh. things that they chew on because it was everywhere. Everywhere you go, you see this red stuff all over the ground or in the floors because they're always wow. spitting the juice. So now we go to Honiera. I'll move faster. And this is how we were greeted. We got off the plane, a bunch of tribal people met us. And I thought how beautiful it was. I was like, oh, this is so adorable. Cool. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? But the they were wonderful. It was wonderful. And again, we went to the stores. And what did we see? We see a lot of oil. Look at the size over here of some of the containers that they're selling. Wow. Remarkable. And again, Chris has videos on all of these as well. Um, when we went into um, fast food, um, I just wanted to have some eggs with ground beef without anything on it. And they just must not have understood it because there was just a lot of stuff on mine and I didn't feel well at all afterwards. And um, there was a lot of issues for me um, when we traveled because I'm so sensitive to food. So I had ongoing diarrhea and I lost seven pounds the whole time that we were there, which I really can't afford to do. (laughs) And so um, that was a little rough for me as well. And then I came down also, I'll show you later what I came down with, but you'll notice right here, this right here, I asked the, um, the owner came over because he saw I was asking the girls who were cooking questions and he was kind of concerned, who is this person asking so many questions? And I said, I'm just a a nutrition researcher. And I said, I'm just wondering what kind of oil you cook in. And he felt that that was a compliment because they think oils are really healthy. (laughs) And so he showed me, and this is soybean oil that they're cooking. And I was like, oh, fiddlesticks, this is not good. So then, of course, we go on and we see their enormous uh, market that they have there, all fresh produce. Again, no glyphosate, no pesticides, nothing being used. We go to another market again and we see that they're using oils. But again, this is mostly um, we're seeing a lot of palm oil, but we were starting to see a little more of the canola oils coming in, some soybean oil. Uh, the tinned fish as well. Um, Chris doesn't really eat a lot of tinned fish. I I do sardines and things. And so I'm always very aware of that. And so I, I said to him, we need to look at the tinned fish. And we started realizing that um, certain um, areas, certain islands had unbelievable amount of tinned fish with soybean oil laden. Mm. And for anyone watching, if you're eat, get, buying tinned fish, um, please look for packed in water, spring water, or uh, like usually salmon is packed in nothing. If it's mm-hmm. done correctly, it doesn't need anything. Yeah. Please, nothing with oils because it's just another toxin you're putting in your body. Just eat the, the fish. So again, here we found the prevalent oil here was palm oil. However, again, the processed food contained much of the same that we find in the U.S., canola, soybean, corn, et cetera. Okay, and the fast food restaurants use, again, primarily soybean oil. Very, very sad. And that's why we're seeing a lot of obesity. We saw a lot in Honiera. Very sad. Then we go to Samoa, which was shocking what we found here. Here we are at the airport there. And again, I think, um, Suzanne, maybe we pause and have a two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have have a conflict coming up. Oh, my goodness, no worries. Um, this is fascinating and I definitely want to get through all of the tribes, but. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We can, can we do a part two? And, oh, and absolutely. A- Scott, anytime. I'm always available. Well, I'll be available Excellent. in time. For you. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Thank you for listening to the show. You can find the Scott, my show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show.